We're going to have Ahmed Hussein, who, of course, is the spokesman for the impact committee, who's going to be speaking to me too. Inshallah, Ahmed, what do you make of this, right? What do you make of it? 20 years on 9-11, we're still discussing it. It's almost as if it's a, some kind of a yardstick that, you know, we're measuring the world with, right? That this is an event that happened 20 years ago, and everything is then measured, you know, according to that criteria. Should we still be discussing it 20 years on? That is a really good question. Why are we still talking about it? Why are we still living with the consequences of it? And to understand why, let's take a look at the world in 2001. Whoa. So when we think about countries that have been mostly affected by the, you know, the war of terror, war on terror, um, and so on, you know, we think of countries like Afghanistan and Iraq, we could even say Iran, um, which has always been in the, uh, the sites um, of US, Israel and their allies. What state were they in? I mean, think about Afghanistan. That was a country that was firstly attacked by the USSR and then an insurger, insurgency that was helped by the US pushed Ooh. them out. And then you're left with the insurgency forces, which molded, remolded, uh, and then eventually became the Taliban. Uh, then we had Iraq, again, a country which, aided by the US, had Saddam Hussein, which, again, aided by the US, attacked Iran. Uh, a million people were lost on either side, attacked Kuwait. The first Gulf War happened. Sanctions happened. Half a million Iraqis dead. Um, mm -hmm. We have Iran, again, a popular um, Mossadegh in the 50s, a popular leader through US interference, kicked out. The Shah comes in. The Shah is kicked out with the reactionary, um, you know, so-called Islamic Republic and so on. Um, and then, of course, um, you have Palestine through all of this, um, yeah. which is always being treated as a terrorist, uh, even though they're, they are one of the most terrorized people in the world. So why, why, sorry, let, why I explain all of that? We got to understand 2001 comes and go, comes along and the war on terror, the war of terror already exists in Muslim lands. Mm. And what that what I mean by that is 9-11 and everything that happened after it in terms of the response from the US was an excuse waiting to happen. People like Donald Rumsfeld and John mm. Bolton openly admitted it. They openly admitted that they wanted to utilize this quote unquote opportunity that they Come saw on. to remake the world hegemony as they saw fit to extend the US hegemony. People right. like John. Uh, and some people, some people refer to it as the war on Islam, right? Uh, as, as the narrative change, uh, you know, as, as the war, war on terror over 20 years on, or are we exactly where we were 20 years ago? Uh, well, what we're seeing is continuation. So um, long answer short as you want it. Um, the war on terror is uh, at most a rebrand of what was going on before anyway. Um, different countries might have had their post-colonial uh, policies in place. What the war on terror allowed them to do was to rebrand everything package everything and by packaging um, it in some in a language that suddenly everyone was using suddenly it was easier and quicker to bring allies on and to paint the bad guy it just, it just sped everything up it's suddenly by calling someone an extremist a terrorist an islamist it's just that much quicker to paint someone as the bad guy and to uh, unify what used to be um, you know disparate interests russia china us they all jumped on the bandwagon we've also seen arab leaders jump on the bandwagon using the whole war and terror narrative to crush dissent internally in their own countries as well as of course us and nato uh, launching foreign Here's attacks on. we're looking we're looking at it and, we're, and we're, what's the messaging for you know that you have for that muslim community in terms of where should we be how should we be and you know what should be our response because you know, suddenly the Taliban are back and now terrorism is making headlines again, right? Or And then there's headlines today on the BBC, terrorism again. So many plots have been, you know, on the kind of foiled, right? So what, what's sure. your messaging? Yeah. So, you know, just to keep the answer short, I'm going to focus specifically on UK Muslims because foreign yeah. policy, domestic policy, it's a whole, it's a huge picture. But yeah. domestic policy specifically, and just uh, riffing off Brother Khalid there, if we don't, get involved in politics politics is going to get involved in our lives anyway we can't just ignore it organizations like cage that for example they do a fantastic job holding um islamophobes um to account bringing uh, the power of the law against them organizations like mpac uk and others we use the power of politics wherever we can if those who hate islam 
if those who hate to see Muslims prosperous dare to use politics against us, why can't we use that same tool against them? That is my message in a nutshell, because what we are seeing is the prevent policy being spread even though it has been defeated in, in, in every case, in every sense of the word, in terms of its uh, reputation, in terms of how effective it is academically, politically, it's defeated. And yet it is still, maybe sometimes it's being rebranded, such as the upcoming protect duty. It's still spreading insidiously. Even internationally, the UK, unfortunately, has done a great job in spreading the prevent duty. It's called different things in different countries. Even bodies like the UN and the EU are taking on prevent policies. The UN is taking on prevent policies in its development programs. Think about it. These development programs, they're supposed to be stepping in and helping those people in the world who need it most. And they are being strong armed into absorbing prevent policies. Muslims in the UK have a duty to at least our own families, you know, if we don't want to see. Um, Islamophobic policies on our doorsteps and then at the very least, you know, to our neighborhood, to our ummah abroad, we need to tackle, prevent, we need to take it down. We need to show, we need to give the Muslims of the world the template um, of how to take down prevent because prevent is our, in terms of the UK, it's our well, problem. It's experience of, over the last 20 years, I mean, obviously all of these international events have really put the spotlight on, on the Muslims. Uh, you know, it, it's very difficult to take a bit of a a back burner position and hide away because it's just been so forthright legislation prevent all of that kind of stuff has that in your experience resulted in a very active community and a more proactive community than than you perhaps saw 20 years ago but what's been your kind of experiences and insight if i can use an analogy i'd say that the engine has finally been started in terms of movement we're not there yet the engine has started it's just so unfortunate it's taken 20 years uh, of all the pain that we've been feeling. I'm, I'm just talking about the UK domestic scene. I'm not even talking about internationally. Um, all, the, all, 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 the, all the terrible legislation, Islamophobia has become normalized. And, the, and it really does feel like the only reason uh, we don't hear that argument anymore, which used to be really common back in uh, back in the 90s, you know, voting is haram, to, to, to vote is an act of kufr, etc., etc. It seems that the only reason that's lost a lot of its uh, popularity um, now in the 2020s is because Muslims have finally seen the pragmatism, um, firstly, the pragmatism of engaging with politics, and secondly, not engaging with politics um, leaves you powerless, not powerful. It's... Mm. But yeah, in terms of movement happening, the first place we must see movement is our masajid. If we want the community to progress, we must see leadership, planning, organizing from our masajid. And we as laymen, all we can do, and even as organizations, all we can do is to give the, you know, give the roadmap to the driver. It's the masajid who are the drivers for the vehicle that is the ummah's destiny, inshallah.